Thank you. So this was great, great pleasure now to moderate our concluding panel uh, after two days of definitely fantastic presentations and really good discussions. Um, this is the opportunity to basically let these two days, you know, review those. And um, we haven't actually discussed an order, but I thought I'd start with the ambassador because she had <laughs> the, she started us off with a great overview of all the challenges, small states, and specifically the Pacific face. And I would like, and you said, you came here to listen and I would like you to share with us what your impressions are after those two days. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Petra, and uh, good afternoon uh, again to you all. Uh, yes, I did um, say that when I came to this conference, I was interested to, to learn more. Uh, I was interested in two things, to learn more and to see how discussions from conferences such as this uh, could be used by uh, a small states in the front lines in which they are working, whether they are working in Geneva or in New York, where these negotiations uh, are happening uh, to try and address the situation of small states. I should say that uh, the two days of uh, the conference have been really enriching for me. Uh, we've had really s some really good discussions. I've learned a lot uh, throughout this conference, uh, from trade to investment to dispute settlement. I think I just got a crash course in uh, the international dispute settlement system. I'm not a lawyer by profession. Um, uh, so um, I just wanted to to thank the conference organizers again, uh, and and I think the um, main issue uh, that confronts me, being um, you know uh, working with the Pacific Island members in Geneva, across the WTO and other UN bodies in Geneva, is that small states are assuming obligations in trade investment and across a number of issues, um, international treaties, uh, but I think the discussions today have um, really amplified that while we are assuming obligations on the one hand, access to justice or to um, dispute settlement system uh, to, uh, on the other hand, uh, is equally important and I think We've examined this afternoon, uh, from the panel this afternoon, the, uh, some of the shortfalls of the, some of the international uh, systems, such as um, in the investment regime, there's an absence of international dispute settlement system, and also in the WTO, it's very much against the interest of uh, small countries, uh, and we still have that outstanding case, so, um, uh, of Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, and so I think uh, there's still a lot of work to be done on how we rebalance uh, some of these international treaties to make sure that small states that are that want to be part of the international trade uh, international uh, architecture uh, of uh, you know of trade investment and so forth can also um, have access to uh, to uh, justice. Um, so the. I think the main takeaways from, for me, from this, uh, from uh, this conference, um, is probably uh, a lot um, uh, more on the need for the international architecture of trade and investment to ad address and rebalance some of these rules for for small states, as we've seen. Uh, also, the importance of climate change trade and environment coming in, uh, uh, the, the importance of environment and climate change coming in and interfacing with both the trade and investment side. Uh, and, and because climate change is affecting um, the trade uh, and investment in small states, uh, this is something that, uh, that, um, that help has, has helped me in the discussions today to see both. I've only been seeing the trade side not so much the investment side, 
but uh, this conference has helped me uh, to also uh, look at the investment, the investment uh, side. Um, yes, on the in international uh, dispute settlement uh, system, uh, and I really thank the panel this afternoon. I remember the, um, after the Pacific Island Countries Trade Agreement came into force, uh, and uh, the, uh, there was a dispute between Fiji and Vanuatu over biscuits, Fiji's biscuit exports to Vanuatu. Uh, Vanuatu did not uh, accept Fiji biscuits uh, because they said it didn't meet the rules of origin and, and so forth. So Vanuatu slammed, um, so Fiji slammed uh, uh, a ban on cover from Vanuatu. Um, and so in the PICTA agreement, uh, the dispute settlement system is consultation, mediation, and then arbitration um, by the Secretary General of the Pacific Island Forum. Um, I think uh, um, I think that the point that you made, um, Scott, was really important. Uh, the cultural aspects of the Pacific uh, states uh, really has to be integrated because, in that, in the settlement of that dispute, uh, they were able to settle only at the at the first stage, which is consultation. Uh, team went to flew to Fiji from Vanuatu. They probably set over a cover bowl and settled the dispute there through uh, consultation. So it didn't even go to the mediation uh, step. Um, so I think there are very innovative ideas that have come out of this conference, uh, the mediation-based uh, dispute settlement and also the blockchain technology which uh, was proposed uh, earlier uh, yesterday um, and also some of uh, Ruth's uh, uh, ideas at the panel yesterday on the establishment of funds for small states. So uh, th these are my takeaways for from this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kemba. I, I've, uh, I, I'm, I'm conscious <laughs> that I've come in towards the end of the, of the conference and haven't been enriched by uh, participation in the whole, nor have I prepared anything. Uh, but let me offer just just um, five very short uh, one sentence observations. The first is, I think it is um, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tendency, particularly at the moment, uh, for us to feel as though we're, the world is in a state of crisis, and um, uh, there are some good grounds for that. On, on the other hand, if you look through history, the world has always been in a state of crisis, uh, and it's not as uh, Judge Hillary. Um, Charlesworth observed in an article some years ago, it's not always very conducive to good lawmaking uh, to always be reacting to crises. We, we need to take a longer view as to the way in which we want to organize our affairs uh, in terms of international cooperation if we're going to get good results. And part of that is also to reflect not only on what's wrong with the current system, but also what has in fact positively been achieved we tend to think that the achievements of the, take for granted the achievements of the current generation. Of course, so much of the international law architecture that we have is actually only the work of one, one generation of our species, and uh, rather a lot has been done, uh, which isn't to say that international law lacks the capacity to innovate. That's my third point. It plainly does have a significant capacity to innovate. We needn't regard ourselves as being bound by the particular solutions that we have achieved in the past. Uh, and in fact, contrary to, I think, a popular conception, um, the, the uh, process of treaty making has a significant, built into it, significant capacity to innovate. And my fourth point is, I think, uh, small states may be small, uh, but they're numerous, and therefore, if they act in concert, they're very powerful uh, in the international community, and rightly so. Um, and one only needs to look, for example, at the Law of the Sea Convention, which we discussed uh, uh, earlier with uh, Alberto, um, th to see uh, a convention which, through long participation of uh, small, small, small island states, uh, took on a very different form to that which uh, might have uh, it been the case uh, if it had been uh, framed as earlier uh, Law of the Sea rules were only by the more powerful mm -hmm. states. So uh, there's a capacity there for small states if they act in concert to really affect real change. And my fifth and, and final uh, point is uh, very nice for me to have the mention of um, 
the principle of systemic integration, which perhaps has become an overworked phrase um, since I coined it in my study in Wellington, although of course I did not invent the concept, it's plainly there in the Vienna Convention. Um, but what it, in, what it uh, embodies, and I've had to think about this rather a lot, since not only am I teaching it, of course, but I'm teaching it on the basis of a manuscript for a book that is coming out next year. Did I mention the book? Um, uh, <laughs> is, uh, what it embodies is a really a very simple idea, which is to say, well, there is actually only one world, contrary to what Elon Musk might like to put about. There is only one world in which we live, and the treaty obligations which states assume amongst various treaties for them are held in common. In other, wor in, in other words, uh, it's n you, you can't cabin off investment and trade and say, oh, well, that's something that's happening over there. For the state that assumes its obligations under a trade or investment treaty and also uh, under uh, multilateral environmental treaties, those are equally binding as between that state and other states which have assumed uh, obligations under the same. And of course, we, we live in a world it's not the case that all treaties have universal application, but we do live in a world where the great multilateral treaties have extremely wide uh, acceptation. So the problem we're talking about of doing joined up writing between um, uh, facilitation of trade and investment on the one hand and the pursuit of other uh, equally or perhaps more important public goods on the other is one which is sim a simple reflection uh, of the fact that we together hold together in common these goods that we're trying to achieve. And what we're wrestling with is um, a problem, uh, uh, a, a shared problem. Uh, so I think I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Siobhan? Uh, yes, I'll offer just a couple of takeaways as well. Um, first one, something that has already been mentioned by fellow panelists. It's the wrong innovation. I thought for me that stood out quite a lot in um, the suggestions, some of the very innovative ideas that were presented over the last couple of days. Um, so looking at, for example, in Sarah's presentation earlier on the regulation of AI, the way in which we conceive regulation in certain areas and how that is perceived, I thought that was quite helpful. Also looking as well, for me, at the way in which um, smaller states can really ensure that they put their own stamp on regulation and regulatory affairs within developing areas such as AI. Um, I thought the fact that they can start to consider their own domestic circumstances is something that's quite helpful. Um, for me, as a tax practitioner, I thought that that actually quite, was quite helpful in the international tax space if smaller states would start considering how they would like to regulate a number of their um, affairs as opposed to being simply rule takers, which often is the case. Um, and just you know, reiterate the point that you know, if small states do band together that they can have a lot of strength for us in the, con in the context of the OECD plans that are happening at the moment for reform of the international tax landscape. Um, we have, you know, the inclusive framework, which is quite helpful for smaller states, developing states, to have their say. Uh, but that need for cohesion and for taking collective points of view on particular issues would be particularly helpful for small states generally. Um, the second point that I thought was that um, there are just so many carryovers in terms of international law, different aspects. So looking at Steve's presentation um, earlier today, um, some of the suggestions, again, quite innovative, um, around having, for example, full-time adjudicators in the international arbitration space. Um, we're seeing more and more in my area in international tax where we're moving towards arbitration as a way to resolve, um, or at least that's something that's being mooted between states. Um, and that obviously brings into question a number of issues around sovereignty. How do states feel about having, um, when it comes to their tax affairs, having a third party um, being involved there? Now, to the extent that they're willing to yield a degree of sovereignty in other areas, query whether they will one day feel comfortable enough to get there as it pertains to other areas such as taxation. Uh, but it's interesting that uh, there are certain carryovers and certain areas in which experts in different areas of international tax law can use to cross-fertilize and inform um, other areas. So I'll stop there. Um, stop there. Thank you. So we're going to end with Katharina, Professor Katharina Adam. One thing I wanted to, she has asked me actually to mention, <laughs> mention is 
And that maybe is something that's also maybe slightly changed in the last seven years as for her and maybe for many of you was the number of women on the panel um, is something to also notice. We always made an effort, but uh, I think we have succeeded that we now nearly have often more women on panels um, than men. So we might need affirmative action at some <laughs> point in that, in that regard as well. But that's, uh, <laughs> um, So Katarina, your observation. My observation, and I made a lot. First of all, thank you so much again for having me here and, and to allow me to learn so many things. It is really like I'm opening a new door and go into so many new fields of, oh my goodness, this, how interesting is this? And I've never have seen that from this angle. So <coughs> why haven't? Really, it triggered me a lot, what I've learned during these two days. And um, let me start with our distinguished ambassador. What you've mentioned, and you've mentioned several things which really somehow <coughs> triggered me. Um, you talked about the trade challenges for small states and I've never thought about this, that for instance, when we are following the rule by a uh, Green Deal issued by the EU, that this could harm small states in some regards. And things like this brings me to the, um, yeah, to recognize that obviously justice is not that much in balance as I thought, as not being a lawyer, it would be in balance. So for me, I've learned right now also on this conference that we have a lot of work on the table, not only for you as being a lawyer, also for other, let's say, disciplines to somehow understand what you are dealing with on a regular daily basis to bring more justice, more fairness into the system. And um, therefore, to understand that small states do not have that kind of weight when they sit around the table, let's say, with the bigger states. This is, for me, hard to understand because I always believe that one person, one vote, but lesson learned. Also, I've learned, and this is what I appreciate a lot, and that is more the fun factor, that tax equals passion, and this is what <laughs> I really <laughs> like. I like that term, and, and I had to say this again. Uh, another thing which I thaw thought is very interesting was the uh, economic diplomacy, also a term which I think it's very interesting to look after, but my question is, is this applicable also for small states in this way it was uh, proposed here in this um, conference or at this conference so maybe we have to dive also a little bit deeper into and understand what this is about and what kind of requirements are needed and who is going to coin who's, who's going to claim these kind of requirements what I've also learned and this is very very interesting for me to negotiation skills that this is depending on, and that obviously not all small states have the, the, the same negotiation skills, or probably they are not offered to them. Which again brings me back to why is this in this regard? Please tell me, as not being a lawyer, I would like to know more about that. Why do we have differences in this s system? Probably you can explain this to me a bit later. Last but not least, um, I heard about, yes, the cross-border issues, which I found very interesting, so that obviously the uh, laws and regulation is local. So why is it like this? If we want to be, be global player, and why is this that much local, which causes a lot of problems, as I would like to say so. And um, last but not least, uh, I, I really appreciate the term Stephen made. He said, criticism to reform, I like this. And then he enhanced this to say, criticism to reform, to change. And this involves for me change management. And what is change management about? We all are very much resistance against any change. Just ask ourselves, you know, to, to go out of our comfort zone is, it's hard for all of us. But, and that is what I would like to offer, and I, this, uh, Petra and I, we discussed this in the break. I've seen so many things here on this conference. I somehow sat at my chair and I got nervous because of, oh my God, this is could, what we could use. How is the process going to be like? Can we increase there or can we make it much leaner, quicker, faster, more efficient? 
And this is from the perspective of not being a lawyer. This is from the perspective of being an economist and, as I say, a technology-oriented economist. So using technology to make processes leaner, smarter, more efficient. And uh, I'm also a host of a conference, which I do every single year. And here is the other bunch of people in, which are always like in their own echo chamber. Why not open both chambers and merge them? And this is what Petra and I would like to introduce to you guys. Probably there is an interest, and we will discuss which date is suitable. This is a complete different kind of conference. This is not the small state conference, and this is not my blockchain at HTW conference. No, this will be a merge conference, where we probably can bring you guys from the legal perspective and the technological driven guys uh, together because very often we do not understand each other and we're talking from our perspective and you know we're somehow not on the same page which causes a lot of issues and with this I would like to say thank you so much and back to you Petra. Thank you Katharina. So I will close I will abuse that position to also make at least one big um, observation the ambassador at the beginning also, and we heard a lot about resilience. And I think what I find fascinating that many of the issues we've discussed today have come up in the previous seven years. And I do come back to my Justice Kandakasi keynote in 2019, <laughs> um, where he did talked about you know, finding a mechanism in the Pacific you know, to deal with climate change and environmental issues. And the reason, the point I was trying to make is that's been an issue in the Pacific for a long time, not having any regional mechanism. What we've seen over the last seven years is now with the climate change issues we are facing, small states have a far bigger voice now than they ever had, I think, yeah? because that's where the world has woken up. And we are suddenly, what Vanuatu is proposing, the Marshall Islands, suddenly gets some attention. We saw uh, Prayana's picture of the Maldives underwater, holding their cabinet meeting underwater. I think resilience also means not giving up, not stop talking, always like, you know, trying to break the camel's back really <laughs> slowly. Um, and I think that's is basically my particular takeaway that the conversations we had this year were not have been possible in the same way seven years ago. So with that, uh, so we will keep on trying to break the camel's back <laughs> every year, hopefully. Um, with that, I would like to close, but not without, and I think this is also a really important part of this conference, to actually thank the people you know, we need to thank behind the scenes who actually every single time make this s such great event and make it possible. So Oliver, I think you're the only one here. You will have to come up for everybody. <laughs> so if you We're starting with you. And I might just announce it and then we clap at the end. Yeah, so that's kind of what we do at graduation otherwise. <laughs> So Oliver, first of all, oh, Oliver you. is thank basically so the heart of the conference that has been for the last seven years, organizing it, doing the PR and everything. Oh. Then we have Saskia, you haven't even seen probably because she is actually responsible for all the catering, for all the coffee and uh, for everything else. Okay, I'll pass that to Saskia. Yeah. Thank you. The other person you have kind of seen is um, Minna, who has been, you know. She's the linchpin. The linchpin <laughs> in regard <laughs> to <laughs> all the technical side of She's things. coming up in a minute, so I can. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have, and th that's the two, pe two people you have seen mostly here, were Sophia and Aaron, who helped us with, you know, the microphones and the presentations. So I've lost that as well. And I think <laughs> now we should clap and <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I also would like, of course, acknowledge our video conferencing crew at the back. Can we also give them a clap? <laughs> okay, with that, it's time to mingle, and um, I hope I see you uh, next year.
And at Katharina's and my conference, whenever that might be. <laughs> Not might, we will make it come true, <laughs> believe me.